people, but uh, in, out of politeness to those who are on time, <laughs> which will now allow us to laugh at anyone else who comes into the room. Um, yes, yeah, so look, I, mean, I have to allow these gentlemen to do a little bit of uh, their own introductions, but we do have a, a John, Paul, and a Vince. And uh, they are here from Cardiff, and they have no interest in rugby whatsoever. Okay, let's be clear on that. Just happen to be here in Wales at the moment. Uh, they are not at all gutted by the performance against South Africa the other day. Uh, that, that wasn't frustrating in any way for them. Uh, so that's well, really great. Sit down now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, however, as it just happened, we were clever enough uh, that through a colleague in the United States that I met at a conference in Hawaii, which was also not because Hawaii is beautiful, but because there was a great conference in Hawaii, uh, an American colleague tipped us off uh, to sort of the area of joint interest, and lo and behold, we have a great opportunity for a seminar that we wouldn't have otherwise gotten. So I'll let you guys otherwise introduce your own background a little bit, but we are all, I won't go around the table, but we, this is a group that's pretty interested in what you have to offer, so okay. let's hear it. Okay, well thanks Jim, it's, uh, it's great to be in this beautiful city, a beautiful country. Um, so my name's Paul Harper, and I'm head of the operational research group in Cardiff at the School of Mathematics. Um, the purpose of this talk and my first initial slide is really is to say what is operational <coughs> research? And I'm guessing most people here might have not heard about the area. Anybody heard of OR, operations research, operational research? Okay, so we're going to introduce the whole kind of discipline to you and then we're going to go through some case studies to give you a better appreciation of how we're working on healthcare problems and also highlight ways in which we <coughs> might want to work closely together, at least the disciplines of informatics and, uh, and uh, OR and such. Um, a little bit about these logos down here, so we're based in Cardiff University in Wales. Um, I'm also director of uh, Health Modelling Centre Cymru, and that's a pan-Wales initiative, a centre which brings together math ma uh, mathematics and computational modelling uh, to bear on healthcare problems across Wales, across the universities, the different universities of, of in Wales. Uh, so that's an exciting initiative. And this one here is uh, Lanx, which is a, was a large investment of about £3 million uh, success to Cardiff and to other universities, um, which enable us to build our capacity. So it's quite exciting time. So in the OR group, we have 21 um, PhD and, and, and staff at the moment, which is the biggest single group um, in maths. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, you know, how we think about modeling for efficient and effective health services delivery from an OR perspective. So I think if you look at it in the broader context, the pendulum is definitely swinging. So we saw in the last century you know, massive advances in the science of healthcare and discoveries of different drugs and so forth. I think now we're looking in the current climate, as you probably all appreciate, and certainly in your own field, that we're looking really at logistics of healthcare uh, and, and financial challenges and so forth, and how do we make the system uh, work best for us. So I think really that the new research agenda as such is still, of course, a massive advance to be made here. Of course there is, in, in, in genomes and so forth. Uh, but it's in logistics, it's in complex processes, systems thinking, and things what I guess you guys do, informatics, oil technology and so on, and that's a, such a vital role now in, in, in health systems in developed countries, at least around, around the world. At least in the UK, in the National Health Service, uh, you know, we're looking at unprecedented savings, never on a scale seen before, 20% you know, cuts in budgets in the next, uh, over the next four or five years. And this is not tweaking at the corners and making small changes, this is what we're going to do guys to make this work and how we're going to deliver a service still that we recognize. And this is what I say to people when we speak to health services managers and so forth, you know, we, we appreciate the difficulty of this task, and I'm saying you do it overnight, you don't do it lightly, but we believe that modeling for what we can offer can, can offer you tremendous benefits or insights into how to make the best of what decisions to make that need to be made. So what is operational research? So OR, well it started off in World War II actually, if you want to go back to the history of OR, when the, the phrase was first coined uh, in the United Kingdom, where um, they started to use uh, civilian scientists and military personnel to look at logistics. So how do you interpret radar? How do you deploy troops? And so forth. It was kind of like, so operations, research on operations. And after the war, they realized actually some of the techniques were being used, the mathematics and the computational science, actually were really useful. And they were used in nationalized industries, um, like the coal and steel industry. And nowadays it's used in a whole range of industries. 
If you had to kind of ask me to explain what it is, I still can't even explain to my mother what I do, so it's very hard to, to kind of in a, in, a, in a phrase. But this is probably the best it gets. The application of advanced analytical methods to help make better decisions. So when I think about this in the context of healthcare, I think about I know our approach being a comprising of these four steps, so it's about problem structuring. So in a health context, I think systems thinking. A lot of systems are cross-boundary. A lot of things go on in healthcare, from my perspective and my observations, in kind of isolated communities. So people are doing the best they can in an isolated way, but they don't think about the bigger picture. This is systems thinking. You have multiple stakeholders. People, a decision you do here might have an upstream or downstream impact, so you need to think about it in a bigger, in a bigger system. And they're complex, right? This is a complex industry. Um, think about an acute hospital. How many patients pass through in a day, an acute hospital? It's like a big industry. Then we think about building a model. And this t tends to be typically a model that goes on a computer, a computer model, or whatever, something like that. Um, the kind of models we can build can be very operational. It can be, for example, can you optimize or can you create a schedule for an operating theater? that maximizes throughput at that level of detail. Or it can be very strategic. It can be how many workforce do I need over the next five years, uh, the number of medical people to train in Wales for the next 20 years. It can be quite high level. But they do tend to be dynamic because health processes uh, happen in real time as people progress through pathways or diseases and so forth. Uh, validation is, is an important point and it can be very tricky. We'll come, come back to that. But the whole point of uh, having gone through this, observing systems, talking to people, building models to replicate and uh, you know, mimic systems, is the benefit is then you can say, what if? So having got a model, I validate it, and I think it represents a process, and we'll give you plenty of examples of that. Now, what if, for example, I, we change something? So rather than do it in the real world, right, you wouldn't, you know, if you're, if you're running an airport, you wouldn't say, hey, what if planes landed every 20 seconds rather than every minute? Right? You wouldn't just do that and try and, fingers crossed, right? You'd build a model to try it first, and then if it worked, or you evaluate the likely impact, then you would implement the one that you felt was the best uh, solution. So likewise, you know, what if we, are, we can identify bottlenecks, we can help redesign systems, and the whole point is to try and improve outcomes and uh, efficiency. So all in all, it's kind of more informed decision making. That means that we are not working in our own offices in the dark, we are working with people collaboratively. So we get out there, we speak to health services managers, people on the ground, we understand and map pathways and so forth. This is what we teach uh, our students, our master's program in OR. This is what I call the tool bag of OR techniques. So to give you a flavor of what we're kind of talking about here, um, we're talking things from com uh, computer simulation, and I'll give you an example of that in a minute. We're talking about things like queuing theory, modeling people in the queue and how they behave in queues, decision analysis, networks, game theory, optimization, trying to maximize some sort of objective function, heuristic methods, scheduling, forecasting. So that's what I would uh, say would, would be in a, a tool bag of techniques for an operational researcher. So our overall goal, before we get on to some examples, is, is transforming the quality and cost of healthcare delivery through maybe through simulation, through modeling and systems thinking. Uh, I've mentioned about this initiative I'm leading, but also uh, some of us in Cardiff are part of a wider UK initiative which is really trying to transform healthcare through this. We're trying to lobby government to really invest in this, uh, in this initiative to, to to have the capacity to help the NHS as it's going through this kind of uh, quite, uh, uh, tough times ahead. So you might want to look up um, that website as well, some interesting stuff there. So all in all, we want modeling as a first port of call, not an afterthought. Too many times we find, and anyone who might be using too, we find that someone has to make big decisions, they make a decision, and you get the phone call to say, did I make the right decision? It's, it's too late, but I just want some, someone to tell me I think I made the right decision. It wants to be the first port of call. Why is modeling not used more routinely? It's used in every other sector. Another grant I worked on looked at modeling in aerospace, in, in military, in manufacturing. It's, it's routine, it's part. You would never imagine delivering a new service without having gone through a modeling process. Why is it in healthcare, particularly in the NHS, that change is implemented with gut feel rather than any quantified evidence? So you want to avoid situations like this. Which is, our, which is pretty much like the elderly care situation, at least in the UK, in terms of capacity and beds. So if I give a talk to health service managers, my main message, if you want to stay awake for one part of my talk, at least, is probably this bit, is that people plan health services on average conditions. It's, it's intuitive, it's, it's what people know, I'll give an example about this. It's commonplace, but it's actually potentially very misleading. 
We also plan our transport that way as you can right. <laughs> <laughs> So a little mathematical insight, and then I'll give you an actual demonstration on a model to show that it's not just a maths, it's, 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 it does work out in real life. The most simplest queue you could think of in a health service setting. Uh, people arrive, this represents a queue, and this represents some sort of service time. Okay? You don't know how long you're going to be served, you don't, know, you don't know how long of course you're going to queue for as well. So this is arrival into some sort of waiting room, this is some sort of service time with a consultant, and then you leave. It's very simple, like going to see your doctor or an outpatient clinic, very simple outpatient clinic. So in terms of some sort of uh, representation, then we have an input, uh, X, say, which could be some sort of demand. We have some sort of service and then some sort of output, which might be a, a measure of the, the system, so the average waiting time or something, or capacity utilization. So let's assume that we have some sort of average value of our inputs. So we could say length of stay, length of time, length of time with the doctor is an average new. So we would intuitively think that our throughput or our waiting time was based on some function of that average. So people would just use an average value. Now, without going into the details of the math too much, if you actually did a, what's called a Taylor series expansion of that function f of x, you get to this bit down here. The expected output is indeed based on the expected average, but a term which includes the variance. So the key message here in the math is that actually if you have a lot of variability in your length of stay or your, your service time, then actually this screws up the system. This term becomes quite large and significant. So actually your, your waiting time is based on your average plus the variability terms. So what does that mean in a real example, a little computer simulation to demonstrate this? A very simple, uh, again, very simple system. A real life, much more complex, of course. This is a, a three-stage process. Every patient goes through the three stages. People arrive, this could be your doctor's surgery. People arrive every 10 minutes, they're booked in, let's assume they also arrive exactly every 10 minutes because we're all perfect, right? In real life, that's also uncertain. Everyone turns up on time, uh, they check into uh, service point A, which is the, maybe the receptionist, and let's assume that you don't have any data, you've spoken to the receptionist, and, and he or she says, well, on average, it takes 10 minutes to book somebody in. Then they go to the waiting room and queue, then they go and have some sort of diagnostics or bloods taken, and you get, you don't know the data, you don't have any data, let's assume that for now, you speak to the nurse, and he or she says, on average, it takes 10 minutes. And then they queue, go back to the waiting room, then they queue to see the consultant, and then they leave. And again, on average, 10 minutes. Okay. If you had real data, of course, you could fit distributions to this. But you've just spoken to these people, so 10 and 10 and 10. Everyone also arrives every 10 minutes. It looks great. Let's now run a simulation model of that system. This is uh, an example of a very simple computer simulation package called Simulate, just to demonstrate this. This is a pictorial representation of what we've just um, described. Patients arrive, service point A, reception, tests, uh, consultant, and then leave. Underneath this uh, simulation, we have the flows. So the patient pathway is as simple, there's no deviation. Everyone has to go through A, B, and C. And these are stored or queues. So if I run this simulation model, you see, the, I'm going to run it for 24-7. Every 10 minutes, somebody arrives. And of course, the numbers are quite nice, because as soon as they arrive, the next person in front just finished their service. It takes 10 minutes, and they shut down to the next one, and that person just finished their 10-minute service. So this is a deterministic average model, where everybody spends 10 plus 10 plus 10. There's no variability. But this is how people plan their services. If I speed up the simulation, the good thing about simulation is you can split up your working week into a matter of seconds. So I've run that for 24 7, uh, for exactly the one week. What I know is that after my week, 1,005 patients pass through that system. And of course, if I look at the time in the system, this whole experience from door to door is exactly 30 minutes because there's no variability, right? So that looks fine. One of each resource, one receptionist, one nurse, one doctor, system copes. I go back to them and say, well, you told me it's 10 and 10 and 10, but there must be some variability. I know from experience that I don't have to wait exactly 10 minutes. And they say, oh, yeah, well, I don't have any data, but maybe from experience... Maybe 5% of my patients have left, after five, left before 5 minutes, 
5% of my patients are still with me after 15 minutes, and a 90% is somewhere in between 5 and 15. So I'm trying to now get an indication of the likely variability. So even with some crude information like that, I can still fit distributions like normal distributions around my service time. So, so now I've introduced variability into my service times, I go back to the same models before, So I've done nothing different. I still have one patient arrive in every 10 minutes. So I haven't changed that. That's still fixed. But now I have variability in my service time. So I have a normal distribution with an average of 10. So I still have 10, 10, and 10. But I've introduced a little bit of variability in service times. And so the computer simulation now will sample that variability. And if I run that exactly same system, you now start to see some cues build up. So the first person might be sampled to have the 8 minute service time, the next person 12 minutes, and so on. But on average, it's still 10 and 10 and 10. So does anybody now want to have a hazard a guess about what the typical patient experiences from door to door? It was 30 before, same number of patients, same average, 10, 10, and 10. What would you expect to wait in that system now, the whole time? Any guesses? Yeah. The results are, on average, two hours. Oh. Some people go through quickly, some people are still in there after four hours. So that's the, you know, the visual behind the maths, if you like. And that's why when people plan like even things like number of beds, how many beds do I need in the hospital? Simple question, it's pretty simple, but no simple answer. People will plan on average demand. They say, you know, last year I saw 10,000 medical patients. On average, they say five days, that's 50,000 bed days. Divide by 365 days in a year. Factor in some sort of utilization, 85%. This is how many beds I need, and that's what they plan on. And that's you've just seen there why things like that calculation can go horribly wrong. So you need to be aware and savvy to the fact that there is variability. So we can do, um, so the kind of models that we build in our group, they can be very detailed models like that. This is an example of an outpatient, um, thing. this is an example of a, a more detailed, more complex uh, system. Of course, that is a very simple system. This is an actual example of uh, an ENT, you know, and throat clinic. Uh, and these are the, these arrows, it's a mess, spaghetti, but this actually represents possible routes through a simple clinic. This is one clinic on one afternoon, and you've got people like, well, you've got audiologists and so forth. And this was an example where we build a computer simulation model and to, to model flows through that. It's complex care pathways, it had different types of patients in there, new patients, urgent and so on. And we found by looking at the schedule, so the schedule was at 2 o'clock, we book in 5 patients, at 10 past 2 we book in 3 patients. This, was, this, this schedule had just evolved over time. No one knew exactly why that was the case, but they always used it, right? We found, just with some clever thinking, with, a, with no extra resources, we haven't got the luxury to have another consultant, we actually found a schedule which helps with a 55% reduction in your average waiting time, just by, the, by rescheduling the arrival times around the, uh, the clinic times. And that actually has an impact, not only of benefit to patients who are waiting less time, but also for staff. It's, it's less kind of peaks and troughs in the day. You've got a much more constant flow of work. And that schedule was actually implemented across the different types of clinics in the hospital. That's an example of very operational when we're looking at like a clinic, a theatre. But we can also do much more high level systems thinking models. And this is an example of a, a, what we call a system dynamics type model. Where now we're not so worried about the day-to-day -day variability. We're looking more about longer term dynamics. And these this is kind of a causal loop diagram which says as you change one thing it has an impact on another thing. And these diagrams and these methods are very useful for looking at longer term um, planning. And so the idea here is that if you do, if you, for example, increase admission rate, you have more patients in hospital, capacity utilization goes up. Um, but as the, if you've got a fixed hospital capacity, you have to reduce admission rate because you've only got a fixed capacity. So the idea about these, you can kind of flow through them. And it's quite neat because you can also build in, like, if you do one thing now, it might have an unintended consequence, but it might take a little while before that happens kind of plays out. So you can actually have a look at what would cause what to happen. And so often these are very useful techniques when you've got multiple stakeholders. You can bring them into a room, you can actually build whole systems together and say, well, how does my part of the system fit with yours? If I do this to my part, what happens to your part of the system? And then you can build models. And an example of that, a little bit different, we use system dynamics to, and, and some maths to, to look at um, some work with the um, Department of Health 
in England on chlamydia infection. So chlamydia is the most common STI in, in the UK. And so going back a few years now, um, the Department of Health wanted to know, is it cost um, beneficial to screen people for chlamydia? So, um, so if you just give them antibiotics, uh, a cost of about £10, $20, $20, it zaps the chlamydia and people live a normally healthy lifestyle. Um, if you do nothing, then it can lead on to longer term consequences. Um, people recover naturally, but some people go on to, to, to have things like um, pelvic inflammatory diseases, it can lead on to infertility for women and so forth. So actually treating the consequences can be quite expensive, um, to thousands of pounds. Uh, doing nothing, what they currently did, they just have to treat the consequences for those people. But for £10, you can screen and you can do a simple, uh, simple uh, blood test, a urine sample, and if it's uh, positive, then you can give antibiotics. And of course, you can, with, the, with the intention to stop the costs downstream. So here's a little diagram of the people, susceptible population who become infected and so forth. Some people recover and, and some people get infected in long-term mm -hmm. conditions. Just to cut a long story short, behind there is a lot of differential equations governing the flow of patients in the, in, in the region. We, we did some geomapping of the data. This is Portsmouth on the south coast of England. Uh, and we looked at chlamydia prevalence by postcode. And you could see the, the kind of chlamydia hotspots, if you like. And that helps locally identify where they might target the high-risk groups are. So they now go with mobile clinics into the high-risk areas. Um, but the key thing is that we did, we put this into a system dynamics model. And we were able to do some sort of um, scenario experimentation. And this shows that if you actually do start to screen, you do start to save money. So it is cost beneficial. If you over screen, you start to lose those savings. And you can over screen and you actually, it can actually cost you more money. So it shows you at what kind of level of screening would be useful. But also this shows that if you can identify the high risk guys, you can target the high risk people in the community, you can really drive the costs um, down. So it's not just about blanket screening of the entire population, it's identifying the high risk people and, uh, and, and getting more cost savings from that. Yeah. So what's on the um, bottom axis? What's that label so there? What does it mean? This is the percentage of the, the low risk population you would screen on a monthly basis. So this is, this is cost for a two year period for a yeah. Portsmouth region. So do nothing can be estimated would cost about £700,000 for a two year period to, sure. to the health economy if you start to screen. So we separate the population into two, the, the low risk and the high risk majority are in the low risk from, from our mapping exercise. If you start to screen the population of 1 or 2% per, per year, you start to actually, you can identify a chlamydia, you can actually zap it out and start to save money. Who, sorry, who are the percent, how do you identify them? Are they the high risk 1 to 2% or are they just... Right, so how does kind of how does cut that the work? story short, oh, there's okay. lots, so there's another step between here and here. So we, we, we have the data, so they screen, they screen 25,000 16 to 24 year olds yeah. in a massive undertaking, it took a year and a half. They found that 10% of the population had chlamydia. That's why we often we hear this 10% figure. Because um, we had such good individual data about it, we were able to look at uh, mappings against um, social economic indicators and so forth. And we found very strong correlations of chlamydia prevalence to certain indicators in the population. So we were able to then feed those groups, identify where, who were the high risk people, particularly socially deprived mm -hmm. areas. Uh, and, and they were classed as high risk and they had multiple partners, for example, we had information on, on a number of sexual partners within a, a short time as well. And so the idea to show to social department of health is yes, the main message is it is cost beneficial to screen, you could do that, you could introduce a, if you, you know, your 16, 24 year old target, but actually you could save much more if you could identify. And then in the system dynamics model, it's interesting, the high risk people are really driving the dynamics of infection as well, um, with, with their multiple partners and their behavior. So actually trying to target the high risk guys and take them out of the equation as such actually drive and can actually have a big impact on the dynamics and infection within mm -hmm. a region as well. We knew who that we also in the data knew who their partners were and where they also lived in, in terms of social structures. Just briefly, I'm going to just uh, before I hand over to, to, to Vince and John, just to, to list some of the projects, so to give you another flavour of different the very you know, the, the different types of projects we're working on. So we've been working a lot, or Vince has on um, modelling reconfiguration in the emergency unit in Cardiff. Um, we've got a number of MSc students also right now in, back at home doing, doing similar things. Um, we're looking at emergency medical services. We gave a seminar, in fact, this morning in the um, engineering sciences group, and, uh, and, and they've been doing some, some work in New Zealand about this as well. Where, how, where do you locate ambulances to minimise response times? Um, how do you roster crews? How do you forecast demand for ambulances? We did a lot of work uh, with the Welsh ambulance services on this. 
some interesting uh, stuff I'm, I'm, I'm doing with uh, linking with the Met Office in the UK. So we're trying to predict um, the number of admissions into hospital based on the weather forecast. So we've come up some nice um, links between certain conditions and weather patterns. <coughs> so respiratory is an obvious one where the, if the temperature goes below a certain threshold, the number of respiratory admissions you know, goes through the roof. So if a hospital, you know the weather forecast is going to be seven days out, whatever, from the Met Office, then you can start to predict how many people are likely to, to be arriving on your doorstep. And you can plan for that. So it's like an early warning system. So that we're working with hospitals in the UK on this and the Met Office. And lots of things really, like scheduling activities, community care, we've done a lot of information on waiting times, um, and talked about bed capacity planning and so forth. Even things like forecasting NHS dentists. And, and Vince has been doing a lot of neat stuff on game theory, modeling patient choice. It's a big issue. In, in Wales, we don't have choice. Um, you get told where to go to, so you go to your doctor, the doctor basically refers you for a surgery to a hospital, the local one. You don't, in England, choice is a big thing. Um, they ask you, you, know, you can choose any hospital in, in England, effectively. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of interesting work being done on that in terms of how people choose their provider. But we've been modeling from a mathematical perspective, is, is choice a good thing in terms of the efficiency of a system? <coughs> and if you want more information, Vince can tell you about that after. But so I'm going I'm to stop there. I'm going to hand over now to, um, to, to, to Vince and to Johnny, who are going to give it, uh, Johnny's going to go first. He's going to just give another case study about some recent work. So this is really recent work, actually, that uh, myself and uh, Vince and Jonathan Gillard have done, where we've actually taken some of the philosophy that Paul has said and tried to apply it. Well, how do we actually set the appropriate staffing level requirements in healthcare? How many doctors do I need? How many nurses do I need at a particular time? And we'll come to a case study in the end where we uh, show how we use some of these uh, techniques. But the main message, which can probably be extended from Paul's talk into my talk, uh, and Vince's talk, is that ignore variation at your peril. If you set things at this mean uh, level, at these averages uh, level, you'll often miss out some of the natural volatile uh, patterns that you will experience when you observe this data, okay? Um, you might expect something to take 10 minutes, but this rarely is uh, going to take uh, 10 minutes. So what we want to use then is we want to use a technique called seamless spectrum analysis, which is a, a statistical technique, to forecast the amount of people that will be entering a system. For us, it's going to be uh, a healthcare system, but it can be uh, any system that we want. And the reason why we use this statistical technique is it will naturally take into account the variation in the system. It will also naturally take into account some of the natural seasonalities in the system. So, for example, it's natural to expect that there may be um, more demand on uh, ambulances on, on the weekend as opposed to the middle of the week, you know, people going out on the weekends and so on. Similarly, you might expect more of a demand on an ambulance service uh, at Christmas time. You know, uh, in the UK, that's when the weather is particularly worse. And so we want to use then a statistical method which takes into account the variation and some of the seasonalities that we might uh, also uh, expect uh, as well. So, I mean, the general formulation then, as Paul said, is that we want to try and make a model, but how we make that model is by getting data to actually populate that model. We get a handle on such variability by noticing the variation uh, in data. The reason why we're interested in this then, of course, is that there is growing demand uh, for healthcare. Uh, early this morning, I gave a talk about the number of calls made to the Welsh Ambulance Service Trust, and that is going up year upon year. Also, it's volatile, okay, the number of arrivals at a healthcare facility, whatever it may be, you know, it's not a steady thing. Who knows what it's going to be? And so we use a technique called SSA, which will take into account the seasonality and this volatility to give us good forecasts. Once we know, for example, that a certain number of patients are going to turn up tomorrow, then we can start thinking about the number of staff that we need to set in order for those patients not to have to, for example, wait too long or to be seen in a certain amount of time. So here's the standard course sort of picture. I mean, this can be applied to any scenario. It doesn't have to be a healthcare. It can be a fast food restaurant or whatever. We have people arriving at a certain rate lambda. So we might know in advance from data or just from talking to whoever's in charge that people arrive at a rate of two per hour. They then enter a queue. 
We then have, for a particular service, a number of servers. So we could have two, three, four, five doctors. We could have six uh, checkouts or whatever. And we could know, for example, that each one of these servers has a particular service rate for you. So um, people could arrive two per hour, and each server could serve people one per hour. Okay. So we have three things going on here. People arriving.